in our seminar series for this academic year. We probably will have some other people wandering in as well. I'm Dan O'Brien, the director of the Texas School Project and our UT Dallas Education Research Center. Uh, the, there are three education research centers in Texas. In fact, we had a meeting uh, on Wednesday of this week at the coordinating board where Colby Stilber, our speaker, works, uh, and uh, called the Joint Advisory Board meeting. They are the ones that oversee the uh, Education Research Center. It's Robert Scott, the Commissioner of Education, and Raymond Brett is the Commissioner of Higher Education, and 10 of their appointees and their general counsels are who we meet with when we go to those, go to those meetings. At any rate, it was at the Coordinating Board because the Texas Higher Education Coordinating Board is the senior partner among those agencies in managing our Education Research Center, which has the data that enables the research that we do in education here at the Texas Schools Project as well. And so in last month we had uh, Jim Van Overshell from Texas Education Agency. This month we could do nothing else but have someone from the Higher Education Coordinating Board. Uh, and Susan Brown, who is the, who is the Associate Commissioner of that, she is anyway, at the, at the Coordinating Board suggested that Colby would be, would be perfect for us. So I want to so so I want to invite our senior partners representative here from from the coordinating board, Colby Stover, and also thank the coordinating board publicly for their many efforts to make our education research center and therefore enable our Texas School Project research here at UTD. And thank you for coming today. We really appreciate it. Feel free to ask questions anytime. We we keep this relatively inform informal, and uh, and Colby says he's ready. Thank you, Dan. So I'm Kristen Kloppenstein. I'm a senior researcher at the Texas Schools Project, also known as the UT Dallas Education Research Center, or UTDERC. And so I will be um, introducing Colby a little more formally. Formally, um, As Dan said, he's a, a senior research specialist for the Texas Higher Education Coordinating Board. Um, and it, he's responsible in this role um, for the assessment of educational outcome data for the coordinating board. And uh, he manages and directs several research and data projects, including developmental education, and uh, research, and today's topic, local vertical alignment, also known as high school to college course alignment. So Dr. Stover holds a PhD in experimental psychology from uh, UTEP, and we were just talking the way over here about some of his fascinating work uh, in psychology there. And I think he uh, promises to deliver an interesting talk. So please join me in welcoming Colby Stover. Thank you. Uh, I've divided this speech up into three components. First is just telling you uh, what the Pathways Project is about, the Local Vertical Alignment Project. Uh, the second part is going to give you a little bit of data as uh, the faculty teams would actually receive in the Pathways Project. And the third part is more higher level research that we're actually doing with this data, since we have all of ISD data, two-year and four-year data. Quick overview of the Pathways Project. First off, it's basically a partnership of secondary and post-secondary schools. And all these levels agree basically to share all of their student level data. Partners uh, assign faculty members to all levels, from all levels, to meet on a monthly basis. And then the data is used to generate reports for the faculty teams. And then the faculty teams use the data to fuel interventions, basically to increase student success. Now how do we do that? Uh, the first project, and probably at the beginning of any Pathways project, the most important part is this huge data collection that we have to go through. And this is many different segments that talk in, of course, many different kinds of languages. And the first thing we start off with is a basic memorandum of understanding, where we pull everyone together and decide that we are going to share each other's data in the effort of increasing student success. Uh, the way we do this right now is we have ISDs, two-year institutions, and four-year institutions sign memorandums of understanding with each other and with the coordinating board in agreement that they will send uh, their data to the coordinating board to be analyzed. After the MOUs are agreed with, we have developed a reporting manual where we go back to IR staff, institutional research staff, and the reporting manual is basically based on whatever state reporting system that institution uses. 
If it's an ISD, it's based on the PEAM system. If it's a four-year institution, it's based off the Texas Higher Education Coordinating Board system. What's really nice about these first two parts is they're already done. We had a pilot project in San Antonio, and now we have basic MOUs. We have a reporting manual, and it's very interesting. After doing this two more times, this reporting manual only changes very, very little. And then, of course, we go into data collection. From this process, this takes about six months. First, you've got to get everyone to agree to the MOU, get all the data people together, and then everyone has to generate the data. And since most of this is taken care of, it's only six months. In San Antonio, our pilot project, it took about two years. But in Houston, it went by from June, and we're already starting to collect data. El Paso, it took two months to collect data. So now we've gone into sort of a cycle system that's pretty easy. Uh, the data that's collected is basically three types. Uh, the pretty typical types that people uh, ask for. Enrollment data. Enrollment data also includes all the demographic information from all levels and segments. Also course data. Course data is very unique in the state of Texas, or collecting it, especially from uh, higher ed institutions. The, cor the coordinating board currently does not collect student level course information. And the pathways data actually does collect that. So we know when someone took their algebra class and what grade they performed in. Also, we're collecting it from the ISDs, who do report course level information. However, the grade isn't attached. In the Pathways Project, we ask that the outcome measures the grades be attached to the reports. And then, of course, graduation data from all segments. And if you like the reporting manual, and I also have some copies out there, are all located out in uh, the coordinating board's website, where you can actually see all the fields that we collect and how rich this information actually is. All right, faculty reports. Uh, so we collect all this information, and we basically have to use it. Uh, the first faculty reports were designed based on uh, CalPASS reports. CalPASS is the California uh, Partnership of uh, achieving, for Achieving Student Success. Uh, basically, they develop this kind of model where we take local regions, we collect all their data, and then we have these faculty teams meet. So we actually use a lot of the CalPASS reporting measures because they're time tested. They've been doing this for years. And basically what they do is conduct a very simple student course to student course match. So we look for people in higher ed. Uh, we look for people in high school. And the first step we would do is look for a student in, let's say, mathematics. And we find the highest course that they have taken in mathematics in high school. And then we match the data to the higher ed data and match that student to the first course they took in higher ed and see what kind of alignment is occurring. How successful were they in that next course in higher education? Faculty reports on the first, the first reports that come out are basically just alignment reports. And these alignment reports are designed just to show the gaps in secondary and post-secondary alignment. And this is very easily done. We look at one course. So we look at all the students who ended their high school degree with pre-calculus. And then we see where they end up in college. Do they go into calculus? Do they go into college pre-calculus? Or do they end up below college pre-calculus? And we'll actually know the exact course they come in, and we can discuss these alignments issues. Uh, interesting thing is, with most of the Pathways teams, when you have the pre-calculus alignment, a lot of people end up in college calculus uh, or below. And we'll see some of those data hits. However, the faculty reports are not limited to these basic alignment reports. Uh, we have done several studies. The idea here with all the data and within the faculty teams and writing these faculty reports is data ownership. We want the faculty teams and the people and the partners to feel like they can request any report they want, and they have. And these are some lists of different reports that have been requested. Cohort studies. Cohort studies are very different in nature. One that we're currently doing is looking at everyone who passed college algebra and going back in their history to see how many courses it took for them to get to college algebra. How many levels of developmental education did it take for a typical student to uh, get to college algebra? And what course did they take in high school also is a piece of that study. Predictive modeling. 
Uh, we take a whole bunch of information and actually try to predict which students are going to be successful and which students are going to be placed based off of ISD records, higher education records as well. We also do very special topic reports. Uh, one that's very special is study skills or learning strategies. We were lucky. A researcher in one of the San Antonio schools was actually collecting data on the entire freshman class on motivation, on the learning strategies and their abilities before they took any uh, college courses. So we were actually able to look at outcomes with motivation and all this stuff that we normally would have no access to whatsoever. We're also studying dual credit with this, a very hot button issue in the state of Texas. And looking where people are going, how dual credits or students are doing in the future, and where they're linking up in the future. And of course, another hot button issue is we're studying developmental education with this data, uh, which are all focuses on that the faculty teams actually study. Of course, we do outcome reports as well. So if a faculty team generates an intervention, what we do as we go into the data, we track those students that were involved in that intervention longitudinally and see how well they progress. So if someone wants to do, for example, in San Antonio, a dual credit of college algebra, we can actually look and see that in the future. And of course, we also do survey results. We'll actually go down and use different online devices to survey actual students to help in these interventions. Now, the basic idea in the reporting cycle is that of course, the coordinating board reports the data. Uh, the faculty teams review the reports. And of course, many times you review reports. And what do you want? You have more questions. And then we generate more data. Of course, the faculty teams normally use the data. And then they generate interventions. They request more information based on to evaluate the interventions. And then we report on the data. So it's a continuous cycle. What you want to see in a project, constant evaluation, constant change. Um, giving faculty reports, uh, basically we've had some issues of contention and we wanted to talk about them. As uh, nowadays across all of our pathways reports, we give everything down to the ISD level. Uh, and this is very important to the pathways process. Different ISDs, different district, different high schools have different student populations in which to analyze. And that's one of the most important things. Also, different ISDs and different high schools are running different kinds of programs or interventions on their students. And we can actually see certain uh, ISDs or high schools achieving very well and having very good alignment with higher ed because of a special project. And then we can take that project and spread it across all of the partner ISDs. Uh, the one thing that we do say in Pathways is shut down right away. We do not compare ISDs in the Pathways project. We only evaluate Pathways interventions. Faculty teams, uh, faculty teams once again are faculty from all levels of education. Secondary, post-secondary, from the two-year institutions and four-year institutions getting into a room together. Uh, matter of fact, uh, our rule is it's all people who actually teach students. Um, and these teams are designed and given the goal to focus on local uh, issues. And they're broken into subject areas. So we have a mathematics team, an English team, a US history team, and a biology chemistry team in San Antonio and Houston. And all these teams receive very different course reports and alignment reports. The way we organize faculty teams is they're first supported by a regional coordinator. That's someone who's normally a half-time employee that makes sure that individuals have a meeting place, uh, that they're given the necessary materials, and they also provide that communication gap between the different segments for the ISDs and the two-year and four-year institutions. The coordinating board traditionally provides the data, and CalPASS has actually come in and helped us up in setting up their model. So they have all this documentation, all of this information that we then give out to our teams, and it's easier to focus these teams because, once again, CalPASS is doing this for years. Faculty teams meet once a month, and initially, the faculty team is centered around the data. So we, we basically throw a bunch of data at them. We give them huge alignment reports. They study through it. They come up with ideas. And we start giving them different reports based on where they're going to focus down to. Like the math team in San Antonio, 
start focusing down on the issue with college algebra and the alignment with, uh, with uh, high school courses in college algebra. And then the faculty teams are charged with their knowledge of their students and their experiences and the data to come up with interventions uh, for secondary and post-secondary institutions and then take those interventions back. A big part of the faculty teams and a part of the Pathways Project is at the end of the year we have this massive meeting where we pull in every, all the administrators from all of the different segments. And each team comes up and presents data that we provide at the coordinating board and then their interventions that would help fix the problem. And once again, the main goal of the Pathways Project is basically for the faculty teams to design interventions, change, start the interventions, the interventions are then evaluated and it's a secular cycle, so if we find out that the intervention isn't working perfectly, we modify it and then go through the process once again. And one of the jobs of the coordinating board is to keep this evaluation cycle, not only of the teams, you know, is there appropriate membership, uh, how are people feeling about the schedules and all that stuff, but it's also to monitor these interventions. And the data, most important part. There's so much data in the Pathways Project that I focused it down really on mathematics. And one of the most important areas that we have noticed in the San Antonio, Houston, and El Paso data is the Algebra 2 issue. This is sort of to give you a highlight. This is a two-year institution, and we looked at students who had passed Algebra 2 in high school and then went on to higher ed at a two-year institution. This is telling you what percentage of these students were placed in different classes. I guess the most highlighting mark is that 88.3% of these students started in DE. And I might mention that in this, inst in this institution, basic mathematics is two courses and intermediate algebra is two courses. So some of these students might be dealing with two years of mathematics before they reach their credit bearing course of college algebra. And you can see only about 10% actually proceed. Of course, we could talk about this in motivation. So what we started to do is using some of the pathways data that we use. So we're going to say, what about the students who made an A in Algebra 2? And we see that the situation isn't much better. 73.5% end up in some form of DE. And you can see the blue lines on these graphs mark different bridge gaps. Yes, sir. Placement based on a diagnostic test or self-selection or some wise person telling them where to go? Right, it's based on a test, of course, uh, in a lot of institutions. And so that might be one of the issues. Uh, it may not be the student's ability, but it might be actually be the test uh, placement issues. And this is the things that we bring up with the faculty teams. In this particular institution, their cutoff score for DE is higher than most four-year universities. And that brings implications about how much these students are really, is their ability really in the basic mathematics or the intermediate algebra, or is it the test that's causing the issue? Yes? Please confirm. Ideal situation, a student takes algebra 2 in high school, mm -hmm. goes to college, and then takes pre-calculus. No, takes uh, college algebra. Okay. Uh, basically, algebra 2 would be the equivalent of intermediate algebra. Yes. Do the colleges have an incentive to classify students in this way? Do they get additional, I mean, it would seem like, uh, I'm not sure whether they get additional revenue this way or not. That is, if they're classifying, <laughs> if they're putting students into DE, maybe the students are going to leave pretty quickly. If they put them into college algebra, uh, they're foregoing possibly two years worth of tuition. So, so is, is that the... Is that the motivation for these colleges to do this? No, I don't know that for sure. Of course, and we haven't done any research. I'll tell you one of the research studies that we are gearing up is a finance study of developmental education. Um, that, of course, could be a potential possibility. We sort of hope that it isn't, but it could be. Are these students that took Algebra two as their last course in high school math mathematics, did I understand? Yes. That 
highest. That was and the do highest. Do you know level. whether they took it in their senior year or before their senior year? Yes, I actually know most of them took it in their junior year, so there is a time so gap a issue. there's a one-year gap between them. Right. Yeah, there definitely is. Because that's been shown to be a killer. But now the 4x4 four four will fix that. No? Okay, well, <laughs> yeah, in a way. Why not? Okay, well, the 4x4 four four just designates that you need four units of mathematics. The other one is basically a replacement, of, as I understand it, of math models. But math models is... So you think people will take math models in their senior year because it's easier? So these ones who wouldn't have taken anything will take math models instead? Is that the concern? I'm, that's a concern. Okay. I mean, we would like to see people progress from Algebra 2 to Pre-Calculus, right. but there is this other course in there called Math Models. Uh, one of the things that people have also brought up is that we're switching to end-of-course examination. Right. So one of the issues that we've heard uh, anecdotally about uh, Algebra 2 is that the tax test is based off of Algebra 1 and Geometry, but most people are taking Algebra 2 their junior year or their exit math year. So most of them is prep for Algebra 1 and Geometry to pass the text, and then actually they don't get into this intermediate algebra subject until the tax test is completed. So maybe there's a systematic thing with the tax test, but I, we don't know that for sure. Yes. This group is probably not representative of the whole group of students at the secondary took Algebra 2. No. Presumably, these are the ones going to the community college, so they might represent at least the middle or possibly even the bottom. I have slides of a four-year institution. Okay. And I it's, just wondered if you could track It's a little bit better, but not yeah, too track much. Track them from a high school into all the places they go to see what happened, so you know you're getting the whole distribution. Right. At some point, we're actually going to get Pathways kind of data statewide. Uh, we have an IES grant that's going to collect this information at the higher education level statewide, and TEA has a grant that's going to connect this information at when, their level. When is that? Tomorrow? No, not that's tomorrow. True. Probably 2011 will be the pilot run, because remember, we have to deal with 101. You're going to get great. You're going to get all this stuff? All of this stuff. Did I, know, I just met you, but did I mention how much I like you? <laughs> <laughs> well, we love this data, and this was what really brought this on, because the Pathways data just sparked so many questions and so much interest. And it was really something that's needed statewide. Great. And then we see B students get slightly uh, worse, or more going to D, and then even more with the C students. Um, now, this is an interesting slide because I, I didn't want to. I wanted to move it out of percents because sometimes when you look at percents, it tells a different story. And see, you can see the different distributions. And you can see the distribution within how the students coming. There are more STE students coming into this population. And you can see the different numbers that are going into DE. But still what's very interesting is most of them are still ending up in that basic level math of this institution, and then a smaller amount into intermediate algebra, and then even a smaller amount into uh, college, calcul college algebra. What is your, what's your sample sizes here-ish? Um, in this one, I think it's about 9,000, 10,000. I can't remember the exact number. And this is all aggregated information. That's why it's across institutions and ISDs. Uh, this is the overall success rates. This also tells another sort of bleak story, that if you made an A in Algebra 2, that you only have a 60% chance of passing your basic math course. Maybe. Uh, and also, I use the most stringent uh, rule of success as well. Uh, if It's failure to treat uh, kind of thing. So if you withdraw, that's considered a negative. It's not a success. So when I'm looking at these semesters, I consider withdrawal. But actually, the numbers don't drop too much. When you look at withdrawal, it probably drops about 10% if you just look at fail. Um, and then the same story in immediate algebra. You do see definitely that A students are progressing at a higher rate, but not very high than the B and C students, and you can see the line going down. But still, it sells a dismal tale. So it's not only just the placement in the course. You also see there's either some kind of motivation issue, content knowledge issue, or something going on that needs to be dissected. Now, this is a four-year institution. Algebra 2 students, and it's 59.2% end up in DE. With the, but you do see a switch here. 
basically, in this institution, most of their basic math is farmed out. So they wouldn't take it in the four-year institution, they would take it in the two-year institution, but their intermediate algebra is not. But these only represent two courses, so the story's a little bit better. So if this student ended up in basic math, it would be one year until they would take the credit-bearing course. And it is po more positive numbers because of that. They're closer to the credit-bearing course, but also what we're doing seeing is a different population of students. People who made an A, 44.9%. People who made an A, 54%. Uh, and people who made a C, 67%. So these are still typically kids who took Algebra two as juniors. Right. Okay. <clears throat> typically. Um, and really, if I showed you the pre-calculus data, you'd probably be even more appalled. No. They're ending up in DE, probably at a rate in the two years around 40%. And in the higher ed, in about 30. And this institution actually does the bare minimum for DE, according to the Texas Success Initiative. Uh, their cutoff score is at where the state minimum is. So it may not be a testing issue. And if we look at the whole numbers, once again, we see a lot of this more of the C students. And you see this is a smaller sample size because it's feeding into a four year institution, uh, regional. And then we see the same kind of trends going down. There's less and less of the A's. But of course, we're also looking at a distribution from uh, secondary that's more heavily weighted on the C. So it's slightly skewed to having more C's in the distribution than A's and B's. And this is a success rate. What the positive thing here is, is that we're seeing a higher success rate in the four-year institutions. Uh, the A's pass about 80% uh, in intermediate algebra. The B's pass around 70%. However, the C's are still around 50%. So it's some alarming information about what basically used to be the highest level of secondary and what is, by and large, the highest course that most high school students are taking in mathematics. And I'll show you some uh, course taking patterns that we picked up in the next slides. Oh, this is the, this is the more statistical study, but don't worry about it. I'm going to flash some things up and I'll, and there's another slide to explain it all the way. That, the previous sure. work that you showed for four years is, is for a single institution, right? Yes. Are the, the numbers look similar for all of your four year institutions? Yes. When you combine them? Uh, what, what institutions are you talking about here? I mean, if you have Austin, are you talking about UT? And if you have Houston, are you talking about the University of Houston being participants in this? Right. And they still, even, even like at the University of Texas at Austin, they have numbers that look like 50% of the students being in development. In, in UT Austin, they say there is a little small bit of the population that takes DE, but the vast majority of the population doesn't take DE. Uh, because they're dealing with the top 10 students, they have a much more restricted uh, enrollment process. Uh, this is probably more typical of a, a four-year regional institution, right. uh, like University of Houston, University, University of Texas San Antonio, University of Texas at El Paso. And, and Colby, just to make sure I understand your data, you don't ever pool those institutions, right? So like if I'm within a San Antonio ISD, you're looking at a San Antonio Institute of Higher Education to look at my outcomes. So right. if I leave the San Antonio area to go somewhere else to go to school, you don't find me, right? Right. right. I, I do find you. I look to make sure you're enrolled somewhere else in some of the other data. So I look for you in our statewide system to see if you're enrolled in college somewhere else uh, to control for some of that, to see what percentages are going outside. But a lot of times in the two years, you don't see feeder patterns coming from different areas. And in a lot of the four years, some of the more regional ones, uh, if you take El Paso, for example, a vast majority of their students are from El Paso and are feeding in from that school system. So you do see some of that, and I, I do introduce some of that information. But it does introduce a selection Yes. Best students of course. Right. Yeah, I mean, yeah, that's uh, the nature of these. students probably didn't just take Algebra two right. in, uh, in their junior year. Right. So you see this problem even a little bit in calculus, too. Uh, I mean, there are people about 20% ending up in DE who took this calculus. This really gives the end-of-course exam proponents serious ammunition. 
Yes, I mean, uh, and but there's two ways of looking at it. You have to look at how the test was designed, what is the test testing, and, oh, yeah. and those kinds of issues. Oh, yeah. And as a researcher, you know, we sort of are, we're looking at that test right. because we're also putting in the college readiness component of that test. Um, the math cohort study is I wanted to show you a different kind of look. So I, I showed you some of the basic baseline numbers. And this is what I, I wanted to control by some of the factors that some of y'all might be thinking about. There are differences in ISDs, there's different in student populations, what about socioeconomic status, what about other variables. And some of these uh, models, and I'll tell you, they're the, how can I put it, the no duh kind of models. You're going to see some of them where you're going to go, but you, because pathways data is new, I want to check it with standard things that are found in the field first. And basically what I did is I generated a cohort of students that graduated in the 2005-2000 uh, high school in, um, in five ISDs. And I basically took them and looked two years in the future into their higher education records. And only students that could be found for four years were included. So what I wanted to do is make sure that I had a complete record of this student and see how different course taking patterns may influence it. Um, just real quick, to show you some of the things that are problematic with all data, but I, you know, you want to explain it, is that we had a total cohort of about 10,000 individuals, but we also have what are called untrackables, uh, people without social security numbers so I can't make the link, or my secondary matches didn't work and I couldn't make a link. And I did something pretty unique and I, I tested to see which groups of students using the ISD data were not trackable. And we saw that Latinos were uh, disproportionately more likely to be less trackable and, so, and economically disadvantaged individuals were less likely to be trackable. I also looked to see uh, for that four year line that I had within the ISDs, the people who I removed. And you see that Latinos and African Americans were disproportionately more likely to be removed from the data set because of that. It's these little things that I want to show that when we track things up, sometimes we're missing populations. And this is a good example of that. This is our basic demographics. Our final sample is about 8,000. Uh, basically half and half male and female and predominantly Hispanic. Uh, basically 50% of the students were economically disadvantaged. And I also did a breakdown of how many of these students received what kind of diplomas. 72.8% uh, received uh, the standard uh, diploma 11.1 percent the medium, 7.9 uh, were at the individual education plan, and only 8.2 were at distinguished level. Why? Why, do you, why are you getting these demographics? I mean, you're this is a central city dominant sample that you have. Yes. Okay. Houston. This is a Houston sample. Yeah. Okay. Is that what you said? Well. I forget. It's urban. <laughs> it's urban. It's urban. It's urban. It's urban. Yeah, I, I, it's the Lone Star. It could be any one of the regions, and the reason why I set it up sort of that way is so it, it protects. And all this is aggregated across these so institutions. To compare districts, Dan. Yeah. Right. How about? <laughs> yeah, yeah. As a researcher, I understand I'm wanting to do that, but. Uh, Don't compromise my ability to get the data in 2011 by asking the dangerous question. <laughs> this really shows you what the course taking patterns are in these four years in mathematics. Um, and I know it's sort of difficult, but this is the X's represent a course that a student took, and what's the total of the students that took it, and what percentage were there. And if you look A, uh, A through D is all pre calculus or in calculus and everything below is Algebra 2 is the highest. So you can see where the highest percentage of students are, are at. And basically what I wanted to see is maybe it's not Algebra 2, maybe it's the courses leading up to Algebra 2, maybe it's the pattern, maybe it's not. Maybe it's something about someone who took math models in Algebra 2 rather than taking geometry and obviously taking Algebra 1 in 8th grade where we couldn't pick it up. Maybe it was something about those issues. Okay, I gotta ask the dumb question. It's been a while since I've taken high school math. What is math models? Math models. 
it's many different things as I understand it. I've talked to several different people and it could be a combination. I think in the new curriculum it's become more solidified. Yeah. Uh, in the old curriculum it could just be computation, lower business mathematics. Balancing your checkbook. Personal finance. Yeah. Okay. And these people tend to have passed algebra two and then they take math models. But it's, it's sort of weird. It's uh, but it, that's why in the 4x4 four four, you can see you can take the 4x4 four four and still only end at But it's a statewide standardized curriculum for math models. It's not a district discretion. I'm going to call a class math models. Right. Okay. But it's a little bit more general than what you would see in like Algebra 2 or Geometry. Okay. They not that they're not typically general. They have to pass the course for you to count or just take it? They had to pass it. And there's no special grade cut off though? No. Pass it. This is A, B, and C. Uh, the first thing I did is I basically tried to predict differences with the exit level tax test. And this is one of these sort of no-dud tests to make sure that everything was going okay. But one thing I was able to do is that I was able to control for certain variables. Um, gender, which by the way in all models represented almost 0% of the variance. But because I had 8,000 people was significant. And you don't know math that there's a difference between something being significant and being real and important. The socioeconomic stats counted for at least 10 to 15 percent of the variance in all these models uh, of the importance. And considering that the whole models at the most in this represented about 40 percent of the variance in that variable, that's a huge percentage. But what the interesting thing is, is I was able to control for that and then look at things with that independent. And that's really why I ran these models, to see that as an independence. And we see that the model was significant. All this is telling you is the first four courses are pre-calculus and calculus. And this is saying that these students scored higher on the tax test than the people who took Algebra 2. Matter of fact, the interesting thing about the Algebra 2 students is that they were a sort of weird group. It seemed like they had a distribution of math abilities that wasn't the same. So there were some people in there who seemed to have very high math abilities according to the tax test and some that had very low. So it was a very hodgepodge group. So I would say there's a little bit of a motivation issue going on maybe here. I just can't prove it yet. I'd say as a researcher seeing this and looking at the distributions of these groups and that there's some interesting population in there. Can you the motivation data you were talking about? I can, yes. Okay, you just haven't done that yet. Yeah, we're pulling all that data in. It's, it's another MOU process and getting uh, data with it. Yeah. Do you have any way of measuring how much time these schools spend on preparing for the tax test? Because that's the variable that will screw up all this data. Right, talking. I thought, I thought the answer was all about the summertime. Right. <laughs> <laughs> but I mean, the math models is a historic dumping ground for, for a course like that in, in some places. In other places, it's a very good. good right. Class. Right. Same with algebra, too. Okay. So, um, in the future studies, I'm doing some uh, HLM work. And that's basically a technique where I can take the ISDs and I can separate them out and look at them and see different things. And when I run those models, there are definitely different things going on between ISDs. And what I do that is basically to point out, like there are different procedures and programs and interventions. You'll look at one ISD, and they have this really great uh, math intervention going on. And, but then everyone has their issues. You know, there's but the science. Or they, one person has this great dual credit going on and, and science. And you'll see really great science numbers. And if we can get these sort of interventions combined and written down and made into models, the second thing for us to do is fix it locally. And then what do we do? We farm it out across the state. We find it. I mean, that's a real should intent. You, should you be, well, I don't know. I'm thinking, if it, I'm thinking if you should have another control here like eighth grade math tax. And then, because course taking in itself, I mean, people are selecting into these different course patterns based on their previous skill level. Right, right. And so you're not really showing the effect of course taking, you're showing the effect of selection into a particular course taking pattern. 
more than anything, perhaps. You know? Right. So, so you're not really showing whether the course has made a difference. You're showing whether the maybe just showing whether this. Well, I'm, I would say I'm showing pieces of both. Yeah. I would say that there are probably variances of both. And there's certain things I really wish I could measure. One thing I wish I could measure across the board is a student's motivation. And a student's motivation from going from algebra 2 to pre-calculus when they've stopped at their junior year. You don't think that motivation is correlated with skill level? To some it degree. To, it seems to me that I like to do the things that, I have, that I'm relatively skillful at. That's why I do so few things. You know, <laughs> <laughs> so, but I, I would think... Uh, I would think that there, that there is a correlation there and so that you're picking that up. Uh, right. Right. I mean, to some degree I am, but I would say to some degree the models, spent with the tax test, this would be a little different. And it's a little, but like when I start looking at what levels of DE they predict into, then it becomes an issue of not what you're skilled at, but what you're going to be forced to do. You're going to have to take that credit bearing math course in, in college. So it becomes a predictor model then of your success in that credit bearing math course and your ability to get to that <coughs> credit bearing math course. In tax tests, I could see there's some of those underlying issues. Well, yes. Just following up on Dan's point there, um, I mean, a lot of times these are value added models. And so mm -hmm. having um, the eighth grade um, tax measure would be something which would then let you see the difference. Do you have available those data? I, would, I do have available some for some school districts. I would caution, I'd have to test to see what kind of, okay, I'm going to use a multicollinearity and those kinds of issues. Like I kicked out race as a, as a part of the model because it was so much intertwined with socioeconomic status. It, it really didn't provide anything extra and it was actually knocking down the two. Um, I would be concerned about I mean, so what, what they're testing and what the forms are. So what if it knocks down the two? I mean, you're right. not interested. You're not really focused on how big is the well, difference I, for economically disadvantaged students. You're focused on what right. is the course taking. I would danger on the part of, much other stuff of calling it. I would. I hate to have people view it as a pretest. You know what I'm saying? That it's not a two times issue because they're really two very different dynamic tests, two different kinds of tests. I disagree. Um, I disagree strongly with that. I think that. I think that an eighth grade math test is still an indicator of students over uh, no matter what no matter what teaks you're testing on that eighth grade math uh, because they're exam, not being forced into these still, different they're all taking the same courses of, it's a broad indicator oh, yeah. of math skills because because these tests are that the, the skill levels are are correlated which is overall skill level right. in math okay? right so 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 why wouldn't you think it was a valid pretest? I was worried, I'm gonna, I'll test a few models and look at it and then run some numbers. I'm a big looker at the models and I'm no, always willing to run different kinds of versions and see how it plays out and see how these different numbers come out. It's just, I, I'm a little leery, but I'll check into it and I'll see what that test involves and then sort of check what the difference is in those levels. Because I can actually pull level 10 and level 9 as well. I can pull those yeah, different levels too. Test. Well, yeah, 9 might be... Yeah. Well, actually, even the eighth grade, because of algebra two, algebra one being sometimes taught in eighth grade, might cause an influence. Sure, but that's better than right. all of them cause. But I could put a controlling variable on that in, in districts that I have it. Mm -hmm. Right. Right, so that might cut up some of those variances, because that's what I'm sort of, there is still even some variation down the eighth grade level. Oh, yeah. All right. And basically, Seen. Okay, this is just to see where people are enrolled. If they're enrolled or not statewide. And basically I was checking to see if these different course patterns can predict if someone's going to be enrolled in college or not. Or actually, in the case of all these kinds of studies, if they're found in college in the state of Texas or not found at all. Uh, we don't have clearinghouse data yet, so we're not able to check uh, in other institutions. And you see the and socioeconomic status, most especially, uh, less likely to show up in college in the state of Texas. But you see, these are basically odds ratios. And so someone who took course pattern A is six times more likely than someone in the Algebra II reference group to show up in college. And then, of course, all of these once again show that 
semblance of very different kinds of students sitting in these Algebra 2 course taking patterns. This is an interesting one. I used a statistical technique where I could look at where people were at. Ooh, I made a mistake. Let me pass forward that one. <laughs> um, basically, in this institution, there were four levels, and there was the same institution in those other data, where it was the low, second, third, and fourth level, and then credit bearing. So I classified people in their first mathematics class on where they were going into. And I basically ran uh, a multinomial uh, linear regression, and we find out that, of course, the people who took pre-calculus and calculus were more likely to be placed into a credit-bearing course, even when controlling for socioeconomic status. And people who are socioeconomically disadvantaged were more likely to end up in DE courses. And then once again, we see some significant markers and some of the patterns that are slightly different, that they are more likely not to end up in any course that is uh, more likely to end up in DE. Then again, we also see some more of this variation in that Algebra 2 group where there are some people forcing out. And if we look at this in a four-year institution where there's only two Sorry, levels. that previous slide, you're only showing one of the four outcomes in your multinomial load chip then, right? You're showing Oops. the odds for higher level DE as the, as the outcome. Right. We have other have other outcomes for they're in this is uh, calculus, they're in whatever. yeah this is this is a modeling technique for where you can use multi levels as the DV, DV. right multinomial logit right. or probit or something right so you're but you have four outcomes or something right five five outcomes and your outcome your omitted outcome was was if you end up in either the lowest division of DE the second the third fourth level and then the fifth level, which would be credit bearing. Okay. Anything but above college algebra. When you estimated your model, what are we comparing this odds compared to what? Odds compared to the reference group. Which was? Which was algebra 2, uh, uh, the I group, I reference group. So I didn't want to go into, it was our I, of course, take them better. The outcomes you don't have to omit. Okay. I had to omit one of the course taking patterns. Okay. And the dummy coding. And the course pattern that's getting taken out is, is I. And once again, we sort of see the same patterns, a little bit different. And if we look at uh, UTSA, we had some, or a four-year institution. <laughs> uh, we have a smaller population. So unfortunately, some of these uh, ends and these course taking patterns got too small for me to look at as an individual. So I'm combining the last three course taking patterns into my uh, reference group and running the basically the same model. And what's interesting here is the only place where you see <laughs> that you're likely to get into a credit bearing course is if you took calculus. But you cannot predict the pre-calculus and calculus. Because once again, it becomes a homogeneous group and you start looking at the distributions and some of them are ending up in that intermediate algebra course. And then once again, you see it's very significant. If you took algebra two and you end up a four-year institution, you're most likely going to end up in a DE course or more likely to end up in a DE course rather than a credit bearing course. What I really want to do with these models is take them out of this sort of flat form and move them into HLM. Uh, because there is so much variation. If you just look at some of the preliminary models, you'll see it in different ISDs and different institutions. Yeah, just to be clear, once again, th these, are, these are data based on the regional linkages. So these are right. probabilities for students that from, say, El Paso went to UTEP right. and didn't go to a school beyond the region for their yeah. post-secondary. The only model that wasn't is the enrollment in higher ed, because then I could look across the state to see if they were enrolled or not. But all of these where it's looking at where they ended up in DE or in a credit bearing course, that is all the original. So among those that went to their local regional university, you can say that only those that took calculus. Right. What's going to be great in about three months, I'm going to have a quarter of the population of the state of Texas and see how this all plays out. You know, using uh, our pilot schools, 
as a balance to sort of see how differences and to see if there's even differences within regions. So then, then will you be able to pool them or is that part of the MOU that you can't pool them? We can pool them. You can? Yes. Okay. You just can't identify. Like I mistake did. <laughs> <laughs> you're okay, you're okay. Um, once again, we're showing that Algebra 2 and this four-year institution, is, and I like to say placement, but you know there's a lot more other issues going on here. Uh, it's not predicting the college breading course. But there's a ton of different research projects that are open that we're trying to do with the pathways models. Uh, right now we're working on a pathways linking other research in uh, Alamo Community College. So people have been doing research in that campus area. That's part of the study skills, but then there are other researchers who are doing research also on that campus that are collecting linkable information for us to actually link to all these outcome variables. Uh, dual credit studies. We're also running a massive English study in DE where we're looking at all different variations just like this in mathematics. And we're also looking at STEM. So we're stepping out of DE too and we're going to look at the STEM issue. So we're going to look at courses taken in, in uh, high school and then see how that predicts students getting into STEM fields. I mean there's pretty good guesses but there's actually some shocking stuff that we're ending up that English is very important in mathematics and getting into STEM fields. And people haven't been viewing it that way, and all of a sudden we're showing that those kinds of courses are showing prediction. Um, of course, El Paso Pathways is already up, and we're running information. Houston Pathways is up, and basically what we're trying to do is do this statewide. And ultimately, we'll have all the data statewide, so we'll be able to run these reports for almost all institutions. And of course, if you all ever want to contact me. Um, yes. So can we link this data with our Education Research Center data? No. Why? Uh, because it's MOU protected. So the individual so student... Would you think it would mean modifying the MOU or something? If you can get, uh, you'd have to get all the partners to agree to change the MOU and put an amendment in. That's what it would take. He's on it. <laughs> uh, the, well, the, data, the only data that's missing now from the Education Research Center is the college course taking data. Right? right. So all we need really is the colleges to agree to give us their course taking data. Right. You know, or you have it already. But we, we need the grades for the high school courses. Just we have pass or not. Yeah, so I need the grades. If you look at it though, yeah, the grades are actually... <laughs> it's all about me, Dan. <laughs> The grades are actually pretty important in a lot of these yeah, models. Yeah, no, that's wonderful you're collecting those. Um, it will go launch statewide in 2011. Um, can we change the MOU so that we can make the data available to the Education Research Center? Yes. For the 2011 collection? We, for the pathways? Yeah. The pathways data, I'm not so sure about. I mean, we'd have to talk to all the partners. But 2011, you're saying. It's but that data, available. when it well, becomes a part of our yeah. state system, then that's uh, uh, Susan Brown's issue. It'll be available. All right. But uh, the other one, just because we're signing these kinds of MOUs and doing these kinds of work, it would take literally getting 11 different institutions to sign on board in each region. Okay. Any questions? Well, I wish you luck. <laughs> <laughs> There's so many variables in all this. Yeah, it, it's applied research. I mean, I come from an experimental background, and I sometimes appall myself. <laughs> where I'm going, oh, I wish I could control for this, I wish I could control for that, and I'm writing designs and going, but... Well, I mean, you really, I mean, you really can't. Right. The calculus data gets skewed because of it. Schools get rewarded for having students just take the advanced placement exam, and there's all kinds of right. little things, I don't know, they're not so little, but there are all kinds of things like that that are going to impact databases like like, like, like this cause all sorts of anomalies. Right, and one of the things that we're looking forward to <clears throat> is we're, I think, this close to getting all the SAT and ACT data. We're just going to help us out a lot with controllings for some of these factors. And some institutions, but not more likely, like two-year institutions, is going to be more difficult. So, uh, Do you have any preliminary or anecdotal ideas on Interventions, pathway interventions, and sure. seem to, to be 
effective Right now we're dealing with one region that is just now starting up. They've gone through uh, about seven meetings and the first meetings that were, the first interventions that were set up, some of them were very basic and some of them were very big. One of them was a dual credit college algebra study that's being started up now where we're going to start investigating if we should be doing college algebra, move college algebra down into the high school level as a dual credit issue and also see if that uh, works. Uh, also refining algebra 2 to look more like intermediate algebra or teaching more intermediate algebra subjects that would be taught in these other schools. Um, also some of the smaller things that don't sound like they're big issues. We took all the math faculty and had them take the AccuPlacer which was very shocking to the high school faculty. They didn't realize how the questions were asked. They found out the way they were teaching mathematics and the way they were asking the question was so different from the way AccuPlacer does it. They understood it as math faculty, but they could understand why a student who had heard it in a different way and used different vocabulary didn't understand it. And then we were, they were also talking about testing issues, like maybe we should be moving this test into the 11th grade because then you have a chance to see where you are having issues to where you can then look at those because all these tests give you a diagnostic and they tell you exactly what areas that you're having deficiencies at and then you could focus on that and become college ready by the time your senior year and that you're in college. So something that might just be about testing issues. Uh, there are also certain testing issues that they're uh, talking about as interventions. One is, okay I registered for my math class and they look at you and they go, okay, now I need you to go and take your test. So that same moment, people are being sent to take standardized tests that they have no knowledge of. They don't know the testing procedures. They don't know how long they're going to be. A uh, host of issues that can come into taking a test that has nothing to do about what your knowledge is. Um, and we're sort of talking like that, you know, being psychometricians going, okay, those are definitely issues. Um, but uh, the English teams, really what the English teams are actually having high school and college people being on the curriculum talk. So they're redesigning the curriculum right now for the English teams. So this summer, the college individuals were actually sitting in on the curriculum development. And one of the gaps that they started knowing is that there was different kinds of writing going on. In college, they were asking students to do more scientific or report writing, more about journal articles, and but in high school it was more based on literature. So when students were shifting from high school to college, they were realizing that the students didn't have the knowledge about writing for more scientific reports, uh, that, but knew more about writing about literature and literature reports. Uh, in the science teams and the biology and chemistry, they came down to the point that a big issue with the students was probably study skills. And so that's why we wrapped this uh, research in that we found out about, pulled them in about study skills to pull them information. But their big intervention is to be pull in uh, teachers from all segments about teaching study skills in the classroom so that they can actually be teaching study skills as part of their uh, science course and so that students can learn how to read a textbook, how to take notes and so forth in the process of actually learning their subject area. Uh, we've actually gotten in some pretty high-level researchers in that area, uh, Dr. Claire Ellen Weinstein, to help us out and do this research. So, I mean, there are a lot of different interventions being sparked. It's a very early process, too, so I would say it looks like it's going well. <laughs> and then we're going to have to move into that next step where act, those interventions are actually in place and we're starting to measure that data and making changes. Well, Colby, thank you so much. Friday in October, same time, same place, we'll have Jordan Matsudara from Cornell here. Um, look for that uh, email about that talk, and I hope to see you here. Um, if you are not on our email distribution list, be sure to sign the sheet outside the door here so we can add you. If you are um, new to the Texas Schools Project and UTD ERC, you can grab a bookmark on your way out that has our website on it, um, or speak with one of us. Um, and thank you again all for coming. I hope to see you next week.